I appreciate uh, Jeffrey Harpham's invitation to address the state and stakes of literary studies and applaud the National Humanities Center's hosting of this much needed conversation. I'm also particularly honored to join this conference's distinguished panelists whose contributions to the humanities enrich our humanness indeed. Let me move now to the topic at hand, intellectual heroes. It would be fair to say that the popular conception of the term hero traditionally has had a lot to do with the military. Our national heroes have often been leaders in battle, the General Pattons and MacArthur's, those decorated with military honors and distinctions such as medals of honor, purple hearts, and silver stars. This rather widely accepted understanding of a military hero connects directly to acts of bravery and courage. Such acts must have, been, must have the purest of intentions, driven by defense of the nation, the good of the mission, and the preservation of the lives of fellow airmen, soldiers, and non-combatants. Yes, our armed forces can point to heroes who knew life and death stakes quite clearly. And certainly, military tradition and protocol recognizes and pays tribute to those who have paid the highest price in remembering the nation's fallen heroes. And yet today, there is a greater likelihood that many of our military heroes, those who have served in harm's way, will survive. The traumatic images of heroes, such as those who stormed the beaches of Normandy, have been transformed and even removed from the battlefield into another kind of hero. For example, Sully Sullenberger, the airline captain who made an emergency landing on the Hudson. While in both cases, saving lives and resources against all odds are still the entry-level stakes of hero status, the range of that heroic image is much broader and more complex. Although there isn't time to pursue the range of heroic images here, let me reiterate in this forum that by way of form and function, the popular notion of military hero and the controversy of war itself have served literary and humanistic study well. Catch-22, The Naked and the Dead, Dolce e Decorum Est are but a few testaments, whether in support of or critical of, the breadth of this literary legacy. Let me move next to the term intellectual characteristically evidence of intellectual stakes translates into academic merit and worth. I, the writer, have something here worth writing about, something that matters. I, the writer, want to engage you in a conversation and I want you to understand my thought processes, my positions, and my conclusions. We have a catchphrase in the military, value added. In fact, it has become a sort of automatic reality check for many of our administrative processes. I believe our academic audiences expect the intellectual stakes to be high and therefore demand value-added study. Ideally, value-added study springs from a curriculum that is intellectually rigorous and in the case of my own institution, prepares students for service to the nation. The concept of merit and worth garners little controversy. After all, human motivations most always invest in both. However, I suspect that the attributes of the stakes themselves are far more debatable. For example, I started a list of what literary attributes matter to me. Critical, creative, response invoking, thoughtful, reflective, transformative, informed, insightful, luring, alluring, surprising, and substantive. In mass, the professional judges of value have their own ways to appreciate worth and assign literary merit. If we assume value-added intellectual rigor exists in literary studies, and more specifically the humanities, then what does it take to be an intellectual hero? Does a hero's passion elevate the intellectual stakes? Change them. How, may, how many intellectual heroes do the humanities need to preserve and reserve a place in the landscape of general education? As I mentioned earlier, the notion of hero for the general population strongly aligns with a military culture. However, it's also fair to say that the general population would not readily pair the term intellectual with military minds. As I suspect um, that those in academe have even deeper reservations when it comes to the military intellectual. For example, while, atten while attending a conference on academic freedom at Harvard, I was actually asked, do you even have academic freedom at the Air Force Academy? 
The implications are that military service is antithetical to academic inquiry. Military personnel are trained, not educated, and therefore we cannot interrogate or put pressure on, particularly outside of our own culture, those notions central to study in the humanities. I and my colleagues at the United States Air Force Academy recognize that it's a stereotype we have to work constantly to debunk. You'll hear more about how we do that in my final point. For now, let me just suggest four categories, uh, without naming names, of intellectual heroes. First, uh, the historical greats, those past and present intellectuals who have, to use a military phrase, sustained superior performance. Exemplars in this category might include uh, Socrates, Shakespeare, and or Freud. These white males have found their way into our disciplinary canon after endless rounds of canonical review, or to use a more contemporary expression, they are not voted off the island. The <laughs> assumption here is canonical tenure counts for something. Next, our unwavering heroes, those who contribute to and further academic conversations despite extraordinary physical and mental hurdles. Let me offer just two examples, British theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking and British historian Tony Jute. Both men suffer from ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Hawking contracted it at age 21 and Jute at age 60. In fact, many of you may be familiar with Jute's piece describing his illness in a past January's New York Review of Books. Hawking and Jude overcame seemingly insurmountable odds and have continued to engage in academic conversation and contribute to the body of knowledge that makes us more human. Although in the spirit of Lou Gehrig, both men might consider themselves the luckiest men on the face of the earth, I find the unintended consequences of their struggles and achievements strangely unsettling, if not haunting. In the shadows of humility, few of us would not feel personally challenged by how much these intellectual heroes achieve despite their limited and limiting conditions. In other words, I believe many of us would find ourselves calibrating our own intellectual abilities and notions of courage against theirs and wondering if we would measure up if we and our work would have had the same fortitude, perseverance, and ultimately the same level of impact. Let me suggest that we need the unwavering hero to inspire us to do those things we might otherwise not believe we could do. I mentioned earlier that many of our heroes survive, which brings me to my third category, the combat conscious intellectual hero. They have stories to tell, stories they write, write well, and have the courage to share. One of the many highlights of teaching at the United States Air Force Academy is being able to host such writers and to observe the impact they have, particularly on the cadets. As part of the David L. Janetta lectureship series, the Air Force Academy hosted the poet Brian Turner, a sergeant in the Army known for his poetry collection, Hear Bullet. Turner was recently mentioned on the front page of the New York Times in an article about people who have been to war recently and are writing about it. He's a quiet and unassuming man, heroic in what he went through, intellectually heroic in what he's able to produce. I'm sure you can join me in offering other examples. These heroes have and will continue to change literature and notions of humanistic study. What's involved in having the courage to relive a traumatic event in your writing? What motivates it? What makes the narrative in the poetry so poignant, powerful, disruptive, and healing? My final category of the intellectual hero won't surprise you if you've had the pleasure of getting a National Humanities Center t-shirt. Where's Richard Schramm? Is he still here? Okay. Um, the motto of the center is those who can do, those who can do, those who can do better, teach. <laughs> yes, teachers are daily intellectual heroes. From the front lines of community colleges to military academies, those who feel the weight of their charge to teach and teach well are heroic indeed. Let me speak specifically about the special context of military academies. Like you, faculty members of military institutions prepare their students in engaging and personal ways. But let me offer an example of the unique weight of instruction at military academies. In 2006, I and my fellow panelist Henry Hughes uh, Judy Logan and Tim Marr, who's in the back there, attended the National Humanities Center Summer Institute hosted by Andrew Delbanco. 
Our group's close reading of Billy Budd yielded much discussion, but I distinctly remember that Captain Veer's justification of pu putting Billy Budd to death resonated with me differently. Why? Because I have held a command position. I have, unfortunately, sent people to jail. And like Captain Veer, prompted by duty in the law, I must still steadfastly drive. Veer echoes the burden to his colleagues, quote, for us on whom in this military necessity so heavy a compulsion is laid, unquote. And the weight is not only upon the military. West Point's English professor, Elizabeth Samet, captured her experiences about being a civilian professor on a military faculty in her book, Soldier's Heart. Among many things, she reviews why literature matters, what literature tells us about war, and what war tells us about literature. Her account is both up close and personal, up close with cadets and their experiences, personal regarding her own transformation. In a scene at the end of her text, she is asked by a cadet why she teaches at West Point. Uh, Samet is a Yale graduate, and she's also been asked that question by many of her colleagues. <laughs> she replies, I like to think I'm arming you with something you may need, she ventured, something of value. Samet's passionate understanding of what it means to step in front of cadets and develop their moral consciousness, consciousness defines intellectual hero. While well, I believe that the unique context to serve as a military or civilian faculty member at a military institution does indeed weigh heavily upon me and my colleagues, I want to return to my earlier point that all teachers have the potential to be intellectual heroes to their students, their institutions, and our society. Let me close by saying that our teaching and ensuing classroom discussions underscore and reinforce the highest stakes in the humanities. If you don't believe me, I urge you to read Jeffrey Harpin's essay, Teaching with America's Soldiers, in which he shares his experiences leading a week-long seminar at the Air Force Academy. Or better yet, let me invite you to come see for yourself and teach with the faculty members at the Air Force Academy's Department of English and Fine Arts. Thank you.